Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It's Thursday, December 19th, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the five time award winning majority report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal. In the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA, on today's program, Isabel Peneranda and Julian Gomez Delgado are both joining us. They are co-authors of a great new piece in the Jacobin, Columbia's New Awakening, all about the strike wave against neoliberalism and austerity and military and paramilitary violence taking place across Colombia. They'll be joining us. Citizenship law in India, which takes aim at millions of Muslims, is sparking protests across that country in defiance, even as the siege on Kashmir continues. French unions meet with the government as pension strikes continue. Donald Trump has been impeached for abuse of power and obstruction of justice. Nancy Pelosi suggests that they may delay sending the impeachment to the Senate. Donald Trump, while being impeached, suggested that the deceased former congressman John Dingell might be in hell. Uh, And I will say, actually, to audible groans, even in his own crowd. That's the takeaway from that clip. The Bolivian coup government has issued an arrest warrant for former president, illegally removed president Evo Morales. Chile protests are two months on as the UN documents multiple human rights abuses by the Panera government. A... Brazilian Supreme Court justice has issued a stunning statement that the discredited Lava Jato operation that made Lula a political prisoner was, quote, uh, was set on destroying businesses and strategic interests of the Brazilian national economy in an explosive interview in a Sao Paulo newspaper. Fifth Pentagon official announces resignation in seven days. And key Republican Senator Bucks McConnell to have pushed for a new drug pricing bill. And what to expect in the the Democratic debate tonight. Besides, of course, coverage on the majority report. And then TMPS after. Uh, Sorry, you got to do plugs, folks. Sometimes you got to do plugs. It is what it is. Uh, Donald Trump was impeached yesterday. Uh, There's a lot to disaggregate here. And uh, we're going to start with, uh, this is from Fox News. Wait, are we doing number one first? Okay. This is what Donald Trump was talking about while he was getting impeached, among many other things in Michigan, including, by the way, I will say some very good new Pete Buttigieg material. Uh, Let's check this out. The whole thing, and we've ordered a lot of those planes. We've ordered a lot of great stuff. He's talking about the F-35, which is a very wasteful plane. Extremely wasteful. And I won't tell you the story, but very early on, I thought we were going to have a problem someplace, and one of the generals came up to me and said, Sir, don't go. Don't do it. Why? We don't have the ammunition. And I said two things. I never want to hear a president Right. We never want to have a president hear that again, nor do we want a president to have to go through the crap that we're okay, going pause through. It. So he literally, as he's rambling about this Pentagon boondoggle and says crap that we had to go through, the vote hits 216 and then promptly 17, which means the impeachment has passed the House. Of course, um, 
two Demo- uh, three Democrats, I believe, voted against uh, the impeachment. Jared uh, Polin from Maine voted yes on one article, no on the other. Uh, and then two other Democrats voted no. Tulsi Gabbard voted present. Justin Amash, who is a former Republican who left the Republican Party, voted yes. And every single Republican voted against. This is how the vote was presented on Fox News. Donald J. Trump sacrificed our national security in an effort to cheat in the next election. This lawless partisan impeachment is a political (laughs) suicide march for the Democrat Party. If we cannot (laughs) impeach a president who abuses his office for personal advantage, we no longer live in a democracy. They've cheapened the impeachment process. (laughs) The facts show that the president's North Star is Russia, not the Constitution. While Democrats are obsessed with impeachment, we're focused on jobs, jobs, jobs. Today, we have a president who seems to believe he is a king. It doesn't really feel like we're being impeached. (laughs) (laughs) The country is doing better than ever before. We know. All right. After 11 hours of debate, you saw much of it yesterday here on the Fox News channel. All right. So there you have it. Uh, I want to tease a couple of things apart here. First of all, nobody and we need to be talking about this a lot more in the same phase of time. The Trump administration has put vicious, disgusting new eligibility requirements, uh, which will translate to potentially hundreds of thousands, not tens of thousands of people losing their SNAP benefits. Those are automatic kick-ins for people who would not have food otherwise. There's also a new Trump administration social security proposal that would, in effect, cut thousands of people off of disability benefits, which definitely, I mean, the goal is to phase out and gut social security and Medicare. But make no mistake, they've had a lot more support um, and success in demonizing and lying about the most vulnerable, namely people with disabilities on these programs. So when he's ranting and raving about jobs, keep in mind the relentless, vicious, anti-populist austerity agenda that's happening every single day from this administration. And then, of course, what I'd like to see is a Bernie Sanders say to Donald Trump exactly what Trump said actually in 2016. Oh, really? The numbers? The numbers in the economy? Wall Street is humming? Oligarchs are making more money? What about people who teach school for a living, driving an Uber to survive. Let's be real about those numbers. The crisis of this economy and our level of, of uh, inequality gets worse and worse by the day. And the economic indicators do not tell that story. So on yeah. that note, I just kind of want to jump yeah, on please. it. Like it's to be honest with those metrics, those economic metrics doing so well tra- with by traditional standards, Trump still like people are still supportive of this impeachment quite a bit, like half the country, half the country, despite the economy doing as well as like those metrics say it is. That's right. And his approval ratings. I mean, they've actually ticked up there. There's some mixed polling support for impeachment, I believe, is up to 51, 52 percent. However, there's been some recent polls where Trump's personal approval rating is edged up and a USA Today poll, which is an outlier. If you look at real clear politics, almost every real clear politics poll shows a head to head of Biden beating Trump, mostly Sanders beating Trump and Warren and Buttigieg tied or losing to Trump. There was a USA Today poll that came out a couple days ago. And again, it's an outlier poll as far as I could see where Trump led everybody, which I haven't seen before. So there are some concerning signals as well. And I I'll just conclude that. You cannot allow this process to crowd out a conversation on the obscene new Pentagon budget that was just passed, where this guy that Steny Hoyer is correctly accusing of dictatorial ambitions, they gave him a space force and a completely unaccountable Pentagon budget. And I'm not making this point to to buy your logic them or to concern troll about the Democrats. You don't need to take the second step. That's right in your face. That is a profound and dangerous contradiction because you're right. This is a grotesque narcissist who poses a threat to the entire planet. And it is a performative contradiction to impeach him on a narrow thing, criminal wrongdoing, no question, but it's a narrow thing. 
and then turn around and give him a completely unaccountable Pentagon budget. AUMF not touched, Yemen not touched, war in Iran not touched, arms control not touched. I don't even want to read Joseph Censorioni's thread on the arms control element of this. It's a horrifying budget. There is, and of course, there is um, a reversal of his discrimination against transgender troops. This is not left-wing complaining. This is, you better get serious at some point or another about politics. You want to actually beat this guy, which in fact is an urgent emergency. And the other thing I would say is, I don't know what the right move is uh, in terms of sending it to the Senate or not. I think that politically, by the time we get to an election, that this is a wash. I think it motivates people on both sides. I'm not sure how it plays out. And I primarily do look at it as a political exercise because it is a political exercise, not going to get removed from office. And it is an important, absolutely a notation that the executive branch engaging, engaging in criminal conduct is wrong. And of course, they should do that. This is not that complicated. I wish and I would fact, fast track literally thousands of other pieces of wrongdoing over this, including, by the way, inciting racism. What Congressman Al Green was talking about this a couple years ago, my understanding was limited because I had the misunderstanding that high crimes and misdemeanors meant like exceptional cases, not my present understanding, thanks to that testimony, that essentially it just meant crimes in high places of any kind, or, or maybe, frankly, just even damaging the country and being incompetent. Uh, and something like stoking racism uh, would certainly fit the bill in my mind. But all that being said, I want people to be really realistic about this, how this might play out politically. I am not as sanguine as other people because I totally see a scenario where you get to the Senate. I don't think any Republican is, look, no Republican is going to vote to remove Donald Trump in the Senate. Some of them might pay a higher price than others. Susan Collins might pay a higher price. I think, honestly, by the time we get to uh, the fall, people are not thinking about this. I am also extremely confident, borderline certain, that Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema will vote against this. And I think Doug Jones is a possibility. I would not put him in a certainty. I think he's got more, uh, uh, he's not my politics, but I think he has more integrity than those two, frankly, um, and would take this process more seriously. But I also think he's a senator from Alabama. <laughs> and... That's a tough vote. Cinema and Manchin. So you will have a situation where Donald Trump and the Republicans will be able to go across the country and use all these talking points and say when it got to the Senate, the Republicans were uniformly against it and two Democrats voted uh, against it. Now, everybody who's informed about anything notes that Manchin and Cinema are extreme far right wing hacks. They vote the wrong way on all sorts of things. But most people don't know that, and the top line doesn't look good. So I'm just putting that all out there. I, I think they are literally obligated to do this, by the way. I don't oppose it, but I think people need to be very thoughtful about how this plays out and really start foregrounding SNAP, jobs, Social Security, because that is what this election is going to come down to for most people in the key states where people actually need to turn out and vote. Not for people in, you know, Brooklyn on Twitter or whatever. I think when Charles Blow says, like, this is for all the kids in cages. It's th not. It's exactly. literally not. It's it, literally not. It's, That's a disgusting statement. They but, just approved uh, billions of dollars in the budget for border spending. Like, and what, it's just not. And the reason Charles Blow feels Despicable. the uh, need to say that is because people recognize that normal people don't feel themselves represented in this impeachment process. And that's that's a problem. And by the way, that's where and and that's where the real fight is. I mean, you know, I'm I am actually just as I would say that obviously you're not going to go out across the country and tell people that they're not going to have borders or whatever. Like that's look, that is not a that is not a 2020 presidential campaign message. We all know that. I actually have enough belief partially in mobilizing the coalition of the Democratic Party in the best sense that actually going out there and saying that this is a moral certainty that we don't have a kidnapping ring and concentration camps in this country. And we're going to stop that policy. Then we're going to have a criminal investigation of the administration and the institutions that implemented it. And you know what? Yes, they would be able to run with it on their side, give Fox News a ton of content, but it would also resonate 
with serious, well-meaning people who know that in a gut visceral sense. Now, again, he clearly broke the law with this stuff. I don't see, you know, the most credible arguments that I have seen, frankly, are people who would acknowledge that there was wrongdoing and maybe say like, yeah, but it, either it should be something else or are we really going to do this over that? I don't happen to agree with that. But anybody denying what actually happened here, I mean, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. We literally all know what happened. But you cannot lose sight of a larger politics. And we need to be very thoughtful about how impeachment is going to play out. The positive signal is that the numbers have gone up. On the other hand, he's not going to get removed, and this is nothing like a knockout blow, even remotely. So a call for some strategy. And don't say that this is a vote for those children. Don't say it's a vote. Don't say it's a vote about his corruption. Don't say it's a vote. I mean, it is, but not his systemic corruption, not his monuments. It's not a vote about the, the parade of sickness coming out of this man in administration. Bill Fletcher Jr., pardon the imagery, said right-wing populism is the herpes of capitalism. You literally could use Donald Trump's picture in the dictionary to demonstrate that. And you have to remove the conditions that lead to the sickness. Or we're going to be in a serious predicament, even if we remove the emergency of Trump in 2020, which again is the only way he's going to be removed. It's going to be an election. So you have to think. How is it going to affect the election? Um, but at any rate, the problem that keeps so many businesses from knowing their numbers is their hodgepodge of business systems. They have one system for accounting, another for sales, another for inventory, and so on. It's just a big and efficient mess that takes up too much time and too many resources. And that hurts the bottom line. Introducing, introducing NetSuite by Oracle. The business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform and gives you the visibility and control you need to grow. With NetSuite, you save time, money, and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance, accounting, orders, and HR instantly right from your desktop or phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. And right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide Seven keys, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com slash majority. That's netsuite.com slash majority to download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits, netsuite.com slash majority. We're going to take a brief break, folks, and we are going to come right back with the authors of a great new piece in the Jacobin, Columbia Awakens.
Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now are two esteemed guests, Isabel Peñaranda. She is a master's student based in Bogota, Colombia. Julian Gomez Delgado, who is a PhD candidate, PhD student based in the United States. He is also, um, uh, though, uh, from Colombia. They're co-authors of a new piece in The Jacobin, Colombia's New Awakening. Isabel, Julian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Isabel, if you're there, I hope I'm going to start with you. Um, can you just broadly situate everybody watching and listening? What has been happening in Colombia over the past couple of months in terms of the uh, social movement and strikes that are taking place there? Well, Isabel, I think she... Did we lose Isabel? I, I do think, yes. Okay, we lost Isabel. All right, guys, we'll take a brief break uh, and we will try one more time. Sorry, we'll try one more time. Okay, folks, hopefully we'll be all good now. Um, so, Isabel, I want to start with you. Can you tell us about the, just very broadly situate us in terms of the protests and strikes that have been taking place in Colombia over the past couple of months? Uh, yeah, so the, the original strike was called for the 21st of November, and it was called by the kind of traditional group that usually call strikes. So labor unions, the student movement, um, and you know the traditional left, but in the days leading up to the 21st of November, the government launched this kind of mad stigmatizing campaign, and that added to what was happening in Chile and the just growing discontent. That series of kind of public scandals led to this thing, you know, taking on new proportions that no one I've talked to in Colombia can remember um, ever having seen. So the 21st of November just hundreds of thousands of people came out and um, the kind of traditional repertoire of marching to the you know historic centers of the cities um, not only had more numbers of people than I think had ever been seen, but then just lasted into the night. And then these new modalities like the cacerolazo, people coming out with their pans on the street, like hitting them into the night, just kind of gained new momentum and went on for a good week. So every night you would be hearing cacerolazos all over the city, and this was happening all over the country, which was also unusual. Um, so now the the strike isn't as as active as in the first week, but it's still um, going and kind of transforming. So we'll see what happens. So, uh, I, Julian, I want to get to you in just one moment to ask you about the actual nature of the current government in Colombia. But, Isabel, could you just tell us what they were protesting to? There was a package of austerity uh, uh, and cuts on Social Security, but uh, it also broadened out to include uh, basically ongoing uh, extrajudicial and governmental violence against the left in Colombia. Um. So what, yes, the original reasons that the labor unions and the more traditional uh, sectors called mm -hmm. are were against a series of what they were calling the paqueta, so the big neoliberal package, which involved a tax reform, uh, pension reform, the creating of a financial holding with um, kind of national financial assets, uh, these kinds of things. But what ended up happening and what we argue in, in the article we wrote is that a kind of chain of equivalence was created and so you know an incredible variety of, mm -hmm. of demands poured out onto the streets so you have LGBT rights you have feminist rights you have a lot of people protesting shark um, hunting uh, a big thing was also 
protesting that the government has systematically failed to implement the peace agreements it signed with the um, Revolutionary Forces of Colombia, the FARC. So it, when you go out on the street, you will see literally hundreds of different demands, and they're all kind of aggregated in the space of the strike. Julian, who is Colombia's president, um, uh, Duque? Where does he come from politically? And then maybe actually after you explain that, you could connect that, if you could, to why this government has not observed its end of the bargain of the peace deal with the FARC. Of course. Well, Ivan Duque, uh, today's current Colombian president, he comes directly from the Uribe, like he was the one who Uribe elected. Uh, he had not previous uh, like experience. Julian, being Julian, a- I'm sorry. Could you tell us who Alvaro Uribe is? For many people won't know. Uh, just situate sure. that a little bit. Thank you. Sure. Alvaro Uribe is... Uh, the most popular until now, we we should say, politician in, in modern Colombian history. He was uh, elected in uh, 2002 uh, and then re-elected in uh, 2006. And he more or less has like a link to paramilitary death squad. And he is also like a pro-neoliberal and extractivist politician who, uh, after the peace agreements, he, in a sense, uh, create a whole coalition against those peace agreements and promoted the uh, a campaign so Colombians uh, vote against this uh, uh, referendum that happened on October uh, 2016. So, in a sense, uh, Uribe is the leader of this uh, people who are against uh, peace building in Colombia. And he appointed Iván Duque last uh, year as his representative. And in a sense, people uh, in the streets and even in some surveys, they told people that they were going to vote for the one who Uribe uh, elect Mm -hmm. or select. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, Duque is not a man with historical uh, political background, uh, but uh, he uh, won the, the, the elections last last year uh, against a coalition of the left that, for the first time, for the first time in in Colombian history, went to the runoff. And then uh, what is what is, what we are seeing today, and that's why precisely this con- historical conjecture is so important that we are seeing this, uh, let's say, like the fall of uh, Uribismo uh, hegemony. In a sense, today, currently, the holding uh, Ivan Duque president, he has like an impressive 70% disapproval rating, yeah. and Uribe too, it's near, he has a 69% disapproval, which is the highest of any Colombian president, and this is unprecedented in, in Colombian history, which had previously like high uh, percentage of uh, Uribe's approval. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you both to answer uh, the next, the, both give answers for this next question. And uh, Julian, I'll just continue with you for the first part. There were two candidates of the left, if I understand you correctly, running uh, in 2017. And I'd like you to explain in uh, Angela Maria uh, Robledo. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. And then, uh, Isabel, I'd like you to explain Gustavo Petro. But, Julian, starting with you, could you explain at least where uh, this one candidate, Angela Maria, comes from in terms of her position on the left and this broader kind of electoral push? Sure. Well, that's a really... A pre- uh, important question because basically Angela Maria uh, political history, she comes from let's say a center-left party, mm-hmm. the name is like the Green Party, which is nonetheless uh, not much uh, 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 caring about uh, environmental policies mm-hmm. but they move between the center and the left. And in a sense he quits uh, this party in order to create a new coalition and, in a sense, to help Petro to build like a more broader uh, center-left coalition. 
And in a sense, he, she also represents a lot of feminist groups that were uh, out of the political sphere and that today are having like a lot of importance and influence in the political debates and even in the participation and organization of the current strike. And uh, Isabel, who is uh, Petro, um, uh, Gustavo Petro? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure if it's exactly clear. Angela Robledo is, was Gustavo Petro's vice um, presidential candidate. So they went Got to it. two different candidates. Okay, they were part of the same candidate. Got it. Okay. Um, but it is really important. But it's to a talk coalition, correct? Like they represent different parties and interests, or is that correct? They, yes. Okay. But in the 2017 um, 18 presidential election, they came together on the same ballot mm -hmm. under. Uh, a party which was then not recognized as a party because of the opposition, I guess, they represented called um, Colombia Humana. And so the, Gustavo Petro is, um, was an incredibly, or is an incredibly charismatic um, politician who emerged out of the M-19 guerrilla army in, and then demobilized and then became one of the most recognizable senators in in the Senate for his, you know, he denounced parapolitics, he denounced corruption, he denounced a lot of the kind of violence intrinsic in the, in the Colombian political system. And then he became a Bogota's mayor, and Bogota is the most important city in Colombia, and was kind of very systematic opposition and was actually deposed for kind of technicalities surrounding the trash collection system. Hmm. And then in the 2000. 18, he be, what, like, became a, a presidential candidate with Angela Robledo, and it was the first time in Colombian history that a leftist candidate made it to the runoff round, and he got 8 million votes, which was unprecedented um, in a country where the left has been consistently stigmatized as guerrilla sympathizers, as Castro Chavista sympathizers, and where, you know, the persecution against the left has taken on the form of political genocide. So the UP de Unión Patriotica, which was one of the first uh, political leftist political parties made out of demobilized guerrilla fighters in the 80s, was um, systematically killed. So 3,000 of its leaders were assassinated in the kind of dirty war in the context of the Cold War of the 80s. So the fact that Petro got as far as he did is incredible. And I do think that was one of the forces, be, or that is one of the reasons that this strike has taken on the dimensions that it has. Even though it isn't a uh, politicized, like this is not a strike that responds to Petro's particular political agenda, but something much broader. Yeah, Isabel, I want to stay with you on that theme for a minute. And I'm, and I make sure I'm reading you correctly. You kind of, you guys sort of identify an advantage and disadvantage to some of that spontaneity um, in terms of it isn't driven in the top down and by an electoral uh, sort of prospect, but at the same time, some of the kind of spontaneous emphasis might not um, congeal in the same clear way. You talk about the, how the right wing has the kind of language that you just talked about, like, they talk, you you quote them talking about Castro, uh, Castro Chavismo or narco terrorism. Can you kind of talk about the difference there um, in terms of how this movement can can get shaped into something uh, that's durable and affects state institutions? Uh, yeah, I think that is the most important question that the left needs to resolve right now. Um, so I think that we have to be very careful in in kind of romanticizing the spontaneity of a lot of these movements. Right. And they're de it's definitely very important. It's unprecedented. We haven't seen anything like this. And it's happening all over Latin America. So I do think it's very important to recognize and to legitimize this, but we can't treat it as an end to itself. So the, the mass mobilizations, the people on the street for days, um, as inspiring as it is, cannot be our political objective, but is only one first um, step in taking this. And I think one of the warning signs is that, yeah, as we mentioned in an article, 
the populist praxis, um, because Ernesto Wicklow calls it a praxis, it doesn't have ideological content. Right. It can go either very far right, as we've seen in Brazil, as we've seen in Bolivia right now. It, that can all, all be called populist. Um, you're saying in the U.S. or just you know in England or the U.K. a few days ago. So the populist praxis can turn right, and it has in Colombia historically. And uh, Julian mentioned this. Alvaro Uribe, during the peak of his human rights violations, had an 80% approval rating. Mm -hmm. So I think in Colombia, um, we are aware of this risk, but in this kind of the fervor of the last month, um, we can forget that the populism was also used against the peace agreements, in the plebiscite against the peace agreements. So what the left needs to do is um, institutionalize the new bonds that are being created on the street in these days. And institutionalize, maybe not institutionalize, but formalize. We need to recognize that there are people out on the streets for the first time, maybe in their lives. And those people need to find a way to meaningfully connect to politics, maybe beyond an electoral agenda, but definitely in a way that has a day-to-day practice that, you know, connect them to our, there's neighborhood committees uh, coming up and neighborhood assemblies that connect, can connect people to their more local problems. And definitely, I think something we can learn from the U.S. um, social movement, like DSA, is that people need to be given tasks and need to put into very tangible material practices this kind of frustration that is bringing them out onto the street. Absolutely. Um, uh, Julian, uh, can you get us into the specifics? I mean, you guys have both raised different versions of uh, basically the history of right-wing violence and state violence against the left. But can you uh, maybe, and you can go back as far back as you want historically, if you want to touch on the 80s, if you want to just focus on the Iribe era. um, But taking us at least to now in the specific ways that even post this agreement with the FARC, and I, and I should tell people, my understanding is, is that uh, even though basically the previous Santos government, the agreement they negotiated went to referendum, it was rejected narrowly in a referendum, but the government still basically said they would observe the agreement anyway. Um, and that's the context we're in. But can you really fill in the history of the extent and scope of violence used against the left presently and historically in Colombia? Of course, yes. Well, this is, of course, like a long, long history, uh, which uh, does, doesn't only include like what happens in the 80s with the Union Patriotica, as Isabel mentioned, but probably goes back into the 50s, 60s, uh, in a moment where the particular form of the state in Colombia uh, turned out to be like a counterinsurgent form, no? So basically, during the late 50s and early 60s until uh, the beginnings of the 1970s, the, there was like a bipartisan coalition government between the liberal and the conservative party, which are like the hegemonic parties in, in Colombia, and they call this agreement a national front. And among other things, the national front uh, that uh, ruled from uh, 1958 to 1974 uh, agreed to have like a temporal distribution of, of power in which uh, li- both liberal and conservative had like the alternate, they alternate the presidency every four years during 16, these 16 years, while also dividing equally the ministerial bureaucracy, uh, parliamentary representation, the judicial power, and almost all the public jobs. And what does this really mean? That, in a sense, this makes uh, this mark like a rhythm of democracy, of democracy in Colombia, in which uh, left uh, uh, groups were excluded from uh, political participation. So, for instance, the Communist Party or other kinds of populist party as the Alianza Nacional Popular and APO, which was like a popular experiment uh, party in the 70s, were excluded from, from political participation. And in a sense, this is the moment in which uh, right-wing uh, politics in Colombia 
uh, institutionalize uh, a rhetorical repertory in which everyone who thinks or who identifies as being of the left of the left is classified as a guerrilla member. Mm -hmm. So basically, during the 60s and all across along this uh, late 20 and until the peace agreements, everyone who was identified as a leftist was also equated as a member of the guerrilla, which is something that is going, in a sense, to end with the peace agreement, which, of course, is, is uh, like a huge, huge uh, a step forward. So uh, what we are seeing now is that uh, uh, it's very difficult for a right-wing uh, person in Colombia today to classify someone who is demanding public education, more access to health, or even guarantee over pensions uh, to be equated as, as a, a far left-wing uh, guerrilla member. So this is what we are seeing today. And that's a big opportunity. Could you just, uh, Julian, could you just uh, follow up just briefly if you can? Uh, I know it's a very extensive other subject, but just as part of that militarization and war against the left, um, what is the U.S. role um, in, in, in Colombia broadly, but particularly as it connects to uh, military, paramilitary forces and how the narco war gets overlapped with the war against the left of course this is a really like complex and, and long story but uh, for giving you one just one example in 1964 there was this plan lasso how that is what was called plan lasso mm -hmm. and it was like a military cooperation between the u.s military forces and the colombian military forces to, in a sense, uh, threw some bombs into uh, peasant communities that were then known as independent republics. And from that uh, episode, the, basically the guerrilla, the far guerrillas formed. So this is like a long uh, uh, relationship, but that also then will express in, in the war on, on drugs, uh, in Plan Colombia, uh, that will then be exported to places such as Mexico. And it's the way that uh, the Colombian state has approached to those, quote-unquote, different populations, no? Right. That uh, instead of uh, expanding the state with, with developmental policies, there is like a military approach in which uh, assistance uh, translates into, or social assistance translates into military uh, action. And uh, this is like very particular because the rhythm of the political right wing uh, that has, in a sense, uh, governed all around uh, the 20 and the 21st century in Colombia, they have oriented uh, the building of peace, paradoxically, in the name of war. Mm -hmm. So, and in this, the U.S. has a fundamental role in legitimizing politically, uh, supposedly that there, is, are, there are enough reasons to, to fight this, uh, these people, but also uh, giving aid. Since the Alliance for Progress in the 60s, passing through the Plan Colombia, and also now uh, against uh, drug traffickers. Uh, Isabel... Uh, final question for you, um, and just looping back, you guys uh, mentioned before, and you say in the article that 72% of people consulted in a poll, feel that a recent poll show that they think the government is going the quote unquote wrong path. 60% also want a return to normality. And I, I mean, I hate polls like that because they're very frustrating, but I think that that's the honest reflection of so many electorates um, in terms of the contradictions that we're dealing with. But I do, I mean, and, and you know, uh, start with you, Isabel, obviously, Julian, if you have anything to add, uh, you know, in summation, what, this is the where do we go from here question. I mean, you, you talked strategically about what you think is important for the left, and there's been contradictory responses by the Duque government, but where do you see things going in the next period of time? Um... Yeah, I, I do think that poll is at least indicative of what 
the left needs to keep in mind in moving forward. Um, people definitely intuit that something is deeply wrong. And I think people generally reject the government's handling of this entire situation. So in the days since the strike has started, the government has created the financial holding that the strike, you know, called against. It has passed the, tri- uh, the tax reform law that we protest against. And it just has consistently ignored everything that is happening on the street. Um, so I think that those contradictions will continue to deepen as the government's complete um, dismissal of the legitimate claims being made on the street. Um, it will, you know, increase their, the internal opposition and also, frag, you know, fragmentations within the own ruling party. So the Liberal Party, which has never been particularly um, progressive, has rejected certain policies such as um, the, the tax reform law. So I do think those contradictions are um, being intensified just because of the, the strike. Mm-hmm. But what the organizers of the strike and what the left needs to do is, as I mentioned, I think, uh, formalize some of the, the bonds, the grassroots bonds being created on the street. I think we've had a new experience of what it means for the city to belong to us. And this is not just in Bogota. This has happened in all the major cities, even in small um, peripheral cities in the Amazon, on the coast. I think a lot of citizens are, for the first time, really experimenting politics as something that doesn't happen on the TV, but that is something that they um, embody. And so we need to formalize those bonds and turn them into meaningful day-to-day quotidian practices almost. We need to get people on their neighborhood committees. We need to get people to fight for their, um, against gentrification in their neighborhoods, to fight um, for, I don't know, lack of, like, less police presence and more different kinds of security, um, more state services, et cetera. So I think that's, that's where next year's agenda has to go. Bring it to earth, um, in a way. Uh, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Julian? Uh, just probably that in in figuring out how to do that, uh, which is like a historical task, it's important perhaps to bring uh, back, well, the Latin American perspective, no? And in a sense, uh, well, this is crucial considering that that Colombia is the second country with the highest income inequality across Latin America, only after Honduras. And this makes us recognize that, for example, in both Colombia and Chile, there are like similar repertories of resistance, so people hitting with wooden spoons the pots, but also identifying similar enemies, for example, the state, and in particular, the state brutality. Even though we we also mentioned that although in both countries there are similarities, uh, and most of the people have been focusing on on the difficulties of of identifying a a unified leadership, we uh, underline the fact that uh, this should not be the focus, and rather, as as Isabella mentioned before, that the cross of the of social protest today in both Chile and Colombia, and perhaps in other places in the global out is to discover how to institutionalize popular power and in a sense how to uh, translate those uh, broader demands into concrete objectives and this is the present uh, challenge for us thank you both so much for being here the piece is colombia's new awakening it's in the jacobin it's a really really fascinating piece both on Colombia, obviously, but also I think some of the bigger strategic questions you guys are exploring um, have a lot of implications uh, in, in many different contexts. So thank you both so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, um, we are going to head to the fun half. It's a little uh, doing two person interviews always a little nerve wracking, but I think that actually worked out really yeah, well. well done. I was gonna, yeah, well done. was in they the break. Very... I was going to compliment you. I didn't want to do it on air though. Oh, well, of course not. I would love to naturally. compliment you on air, Michael, and oh. say you did a wonderful job. Thank you, Brendan. You should take up more speaking time. <laughs> uh, I thought. Uh, well, it was. I mean, honestly, it's really. I mean, I know how to move those things a bit, but that was a great. I mean, 
they were super synchronized. Right. That was awesome that they, they made your testament to the guests. Become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how all this happens. Tonight, live coverage of the Democratic debates. Find out how many of us show up. I'm just kidding. We'll be there. <laughs> will there be more people? Uh, yeah. Will there be more people on stage than here? Definitely. But how big will the ratio be? Yeah. Uh, it's cold. I'm just glad Tom Steyer will get a chance to be heard. Yeah. I mean, I've been concerned. Every point you see for Bloomberg and Steyer is is it that is i mean we know the whole system is an oligarchy but th those are the numbers for just raw money yeah raw corporate force just raw court like no business being there. i mean steyer has no business being there bloomberg well he won't even be there in fact but he is um i mean steyer has no business being there because it's just ridiculous bloomberg actually was a mayor and a really bad one. A specter is haunting yeah. the debates. <laughs> yeah. A specter is haunting the debates. You might even see this in a majority report uh, video. Every time I see that little bastard's ads, I, oh, God, it's it's actually really You've disgusting. seen Bloomberg ads? I have seen Bloomberg ads on Where are you guys seeing them? Majority you Report do. and TMBS yeah. videos. I got to add them. Instagram. Yeah. Yep. Oh, no, actually, I have YouTube Premium, so I don't see any ads. You don't see YouTube. any ads. It's smart. But I I mean, I actually like to, I, I should get it, but as horrible and as annoying as they are, I actually like to see what's out there. I, I, I mean, I, I think there's there's a little bit of value to that. Um, Become a patron of the Michael Brooks show. Last Sunday on the Sunday Illicit History, we did a deep dive with Laura Carlson on AMLO's first year in office and even the potential of a U.S.-backed coup and how that would relate to the drug war. Very disturbing, very interesting, um, but also I would say a pretty fairly balanced uh, assessment of AMLO, who of course I'm overall obviously supportive of. Um, and then we uh, had a brilliant show on Tuesday with Joshua Kahn Russell. On Monday, we close out the year with Richard Wolf, possibly one other guest. But uh, definitely Richard Wolf in studio. We're talking about his new book. We're talking about the 18th Brumaire and many other subjects. Patreon.com slash TMBS. We're having another surge. I'm pretty confident we will sell out the Bell House show on the 7th. So if you're thinking about it, I would go snag your tickets immediately. And the way you can find out everything from live shows to Patreon to our dope new TMBS gear is to go to TMBS.fm. And you can do everything that way. Matt, literary hangover. Uh, yeah, actually, recording tonight prior to the debate uh, is going to be. A you and I are both. I have so I'm. I'm not trying to. I'm just. I have a thing at the gym, and you're recording. So we should. I hope Sam is listening. Which, uh, just like, don't freak out, dude. Everybody's gonna be here. Um, yeah, but, I'll get here eventually. Yeah, but, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I'll be talking about Pilgrim's P Progress by John Bunyan. Is my, uh, my... is everything okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, it's it's some would call it the first novel, at least influenced sort of the Robinson Crusoe. Um, but it's it's a journey a Christian goes on uh, after he reads a book. I mean, it's strongly implied that it's the Bible. But I think uh, the Bible. It's it's. I was shocked by how um, actual, like it's an allegory, which you think is going to be boring, but I think actually there's something to the form that's very. You hear the voice of a uh, John Bunyan wasn't an aristocrat. He was his dad was a tinker, so he'd like go from house to house, like fixing stuff, like their windows and stuff like that. So he's he's a very uh, working class, not maybe not working class, but like low level, uh, lower level than you usually hear from back then, and you get. Uh, a lot of uh, colloquial dialogue in the midst of an allegory about following an ideology uh, that you believe in. So that's so, interesting. Yeah. I, I was going to say this during the break because I don't want to compliment Matt, Matt on air, but um, I am a satisfied patron. Well, thank you very over. much. Very, very good to introduce some of that sort of thing. Oh, I also want to yeah. say I'm going to be it's very reading... entertaining, actually. Yeah, I, I think there is so. an entertainment value. I like to. I think I'm very funny on it. If I say so. I, honestly, you should be at least letting people know about that a little bit more. Yeah, this is right. not like taking a class. You're learning a lot, but there's still some. There's the, the water boat energy comes through. 
water boat intellectual. Also, I'll be reading a poem by Ebenezer Cook called The Sotweed Factor, which is uh, from the 1600s as well, about how uh, Virginia was entirely swindlers and uh, scam artists and stuff like that. So uh, more, a lot, good thing and America. We just actually gamed one out, which I'm pretty excited about to be on. Oh yeah, actually Michael will be on a Literary Hangover in the New Year. We got a good episode cooking up on that Orwell. Actually, yeah, that sounds amazing. All right, folks, see you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice to Come on, Sammy! Dance, dance, dance! Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil... Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Hi, hello. There's something wrong with the phones, God damn it. Majority Report. Please use no speaker phone and have your one comment or question ready. <laughs> Listen for Sam to call out your area code. Sam will be with you shortly. Why don't we play this all the time? It's nice this to let actually robot... sounds like really good instruction. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's nice to let the robots yeah. be the authoritarian. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let the robot be the best. I'm here to discipline you. Yeah. <laughs> be a better caller. <laughs> Improve your quality. It may be informal, but it's still a professional product. Um So one thing I will say though. And, and I think we've done this. Obviously, Donald Trump will use this to run on, and obviously it will mobilize part of the Republican base because they're aggrieved. But the idea that Donald Trump secretly wanted this to happen is insane. This guy has the thinnest skin in the maybe like literally the history of human race. And he's freaked out which is why he had this demented rally, which is why he talked about, I mean, even by Trump standards, going to a state and talking about like a beloved, like local institution and saying the guy is in hell. (laughs) 
Point is, he's in his, as uh, Brendan said in the break, he's going to his his safe space. He's going to his comfort zone. And for some reason, Donald Trump is obsessed with Tom Cruise, and he is obsessed with uh, generals that supposedly look better than Tom Cruise. Uh, we've heard this before. Generals and pilots. We should and say. Pi oh, definitely pilots. Uh, <laughs> sassy Trump is needed. And here he is in his comfort zone. Missiles with rockets, with everything. And you know what? Again, we don't want to ever have to use it, but we will never have anything like what's mostly been built. We have the F-35 at stealth. <laughs> and I was at one of the areas where they're displaying it, and I went up to the pilots, and honestly, they're better looking than Tom Cruise, okay? Good movie. Good guy, too, by the way. Good guy. The face is equal, maybe slightly better. The body's bigger and stronger. They can definitely, he goes like me now. They can definitely fight. They're the real deal. These guys are so good looking. I said, you could be a movie star. Go to Hollywood. No, sir, I like doing what I'm doing. <laughs> These guys, are, you got to see it. Just like central casting. I said, I said, fellas, how good is this play? They said, sir, it's great. Why? Because the enemy can't see it. <laughs> Equal faces, but even better bodies. Equal faces, but better bodies. <laughs> it's it's crazy to think that this crowd is also digging it too. They're like, hell yeah, you know, hot pilot. Is that I'm really, a man's man. I vote for Trump. See, that is funny, and it is hilarious. All of the like super easy subtext that could be pulled out of this if one chose to go in that direction. But like, I just I don't know, man. I. I think even this stuff, it just works. You know, this, this is a political rally that is fun. Yeah. I mean, the president of the United States is rambling about the relative physical attributes of like a probably imagined airplane pilots right. versus Tom Cruise. That's fucking fun. No, I mean, the reason he continues to do this is because the problem propaganda value actually is useful to him because then there's a story about how Trump is like gushing about troops basically. Right. That and that's the other thing. Like that see that's yes, that's so important. I I notice another kind of like for lack of a better term, you know, sort of like left versus liberal thing happens around whether or not you find Trump funny. And Trump is funny. Yeah. Like sorry, he's funny. I, I find it a real stretch to to claim that the guy cannot be funny, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. I think charisma is a value-neutral term as well. Charisma is a totally value-neutral term, and it matters a lot and as a trait. And he has tons of it. And he is a – and also a bizarre charisma. Like, you can't fit it. You know, you could, you could mention Obama – and Kennedy or whatever, you know, there's a certain way in which you can identify certain types or certain ways. This is weird. He is a weirdo with a bizarre charisma. And I think that, you know, one reaction is to look, just look at it as comedy, which it is. And then the other reaction is, is that, can you believe? And he's so terrible. He's talking about how people look Well, he's got an orange face and I hate him and da, 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 da. What we actually have to start doing, and I really appreciate that Matt did that, is say what purpose is it serving when he rambles nonsense like that and it's and by the way that's irrelevant whether or not we want to say that he's doing it consciously because he's a tv guy and a salesman and a bullshit artist or that uh you know he just happens to be rambling in his stupid brain and it works somehow it, it that kind of doesn't matter what matters is that it does work and, 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 you know, I still see too much of that dynamic from 2016 of people being like, oh, can you believe this? And it's like, yeah, believe it. Thousands of people are lapping this stuff up and he's the president. Is it idiotic? Is it ridiculous? Is it insane? Is it delusional? Is it hilarious? Yes, 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 yes. But what is it doing is what we got to figure out. And, and, you know, at the very least understand, you know, 
Um, this is Donald Trump from the same rally. Uh, and which one do we have here? Is this him talking about? You can either do Dingle or the dishwashers. These were less effective. All I right. Think. Let's talk about, well, yeah, I think these were actually good examples of him being kind of rattled. Uh, this, let's talk about the Dingle one because I actually, and then we'll, dishwashers is funny, but let's talk about the Dingle one too, because, and first, because I thought this was, I thought this was interesting. I, maybe it's being overplayed, but I actually thought there was a groan in the crowd amongst some people. So basically Congressman Dingle, you know, served in Congress, I think at least from the sixties, iconic figure in the state to the extent that we still give politicians that status. His wife is in Congress now. I think she represents the same district. And Trump, of course, being Trump, is hugely pissed off because he did standard protocol, which is he he uh, you know he lowered the flags in federal buildings and I, I, in Michigan and I, I maybe probably in D.C. He gave he helped uh, use resources uh, to give this guy a proper send off. Uh, as a as a iconic and you know well respected political figure, and of course he thinks that means that his wife should be voting against impeachment. Here's how that went. Dingle, you have a hero from Michigan, <laughs> Debbie Dingle. That's a real beauty. <laughs> so she calls me up like eight months ago. Her husband was there a long time, but I didn't give him the B treatment. I didn't give him the C or the D. I could have. Nobody would have. You know. I gave the A-plus treatment. <laughs> Take down the flags. Why are you taking them down? For ex-Congressman Dingle. Oh, okay. Do this, do that, do that. Or rotunda, everything. I gave him the, everything. That's okay. I don't want anything for it. I don't need anything for anything. So she calls me up. <laughs> Pause it. It's the nicest thing. I do love, though, how now it's like he's internalized that talking point. Because I feel like in the beginning it would have been like, people do things for people. You do things for them. They do things for you. That's how I make deals. That's how everything's great. And now, like, somehow it's kind of actually gotten through where he's just like, I didn't ask for anything. I mean, I do things and then you could do what you want because I don't do that for anything. I don't even ask somebody to bring me, you know, a, a Coke because I do it myself. And if I get somebody a Coke, I don't ask for one either because I just do stuff. Anything. She calls me up. It's the nicest thing that's ever happened. Thank you so much. John would be so thrilled. He's looking down, he'd be so thrilled. Thank you so much, sir. I said, that's okay, don't worry about it. Maybe he's looking up, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But let's assume he's looking down. But I gave him a plus, not A, not B plus, not B. So that, no, that, that, uh, that a significant chunk of people are groaned at him. I mean, look, I know it's the soft bigotry of low expectations, but that, okay. There was one leap into pure sociopathy that even some people in his own crowd were not down with. Okay. To, to, cool. That's useful information. To mock a daughter's a uh, wife, a, a wife. Sorry, yeah. a call thanking him for that. Oh, thank. You. No, it's no problem. Trust me. Yeah, no, I mean, he's she... a sociopath. Yeah. I mean, and and of course she came out and said we've been grieving as a family, and this does not help. You know, I mean, that is like, that is honestly the type of thing when you read a book about like, you know, like Hitler or somebody, and you you set aside, I'll just say Hitler or Mussolini or whatever, like. It is actually those types of things that actually end up being like the most like, oh, really? Like, did the daughter cry when the dad was dragged off? Like that type of serious just like, OK, dude, you have no like you you are not on the map in terms of where you are supposed to be as a fully paid up member of the human race. You're getting energized by people suffering right now. Oh, yeah. And also, like, just shout out to John Dingle. I think the last thing he wrote before he passed was endorsing Medicare for all and saying that the Senate needs to be abolished. Yep. Hell yeah. No, John Dingle had a very noble uh, legacy. And, uh, you know, obviously, if we will survive, Donald Trump will be a cross between sort of like a cult memory, a giant piece of comedy, and an embarrassment. Um, and speaking of that embarrassment and comedy... Here is Donald Trump in his ultimate look. There's a couple of things. Pilots that look better than Tom Cruise 
enjoying the human suffering of a widow missing her husband, and, and this might be number one, building stuff. Sinks, uh, showers, all of this stuff. I did a lot of it. No water comes out. You have areas where there's so much water you don't know what to do with it. You turn on the shower, you're not allowed to have any water anymore. I mean, we do a lot of it. Uh, dishwashers, did the dishwasher, right? You press it. Remember the dishwasher? You press it, boom, there'd be like an explosion. Five minutes later, you open it up, the steam pours out, the dishes. Now you press it 12 times. Women tell me, again, you know, they give you four drops of water. And they're in places where there's so much water, they don't know what to do with it. So we just came out with the Raglan's dishwashers. We're going back to you. By the way, by the time they press... I didn't even catch <laughs> women tell me. There's so much oh to all God. this stuff all the time. You can watch it forever. <laughs> By the way, that I have no doubt is intentional. That also, is like, definitely what... a cue to the audience. Like, because the women I talk to, they know about home appliances. Yeah. Is his thing, is this yes. like whole rant basically? <laughs> like, besides it being like he loves to talk about like home appliances and like what it takes to build like a residency, basically. Like, he loves that stuff. And we've established that he's going to his safe spaces right now. Um, but beyond that, like the policy behind this, is it like oh, it's he's going to get rid of like Energy Star efficient yeah. like yeah. products? Pri privatizing water. Yeah. And getting rid of energy efficiency standards. That's amazing. Yeah. Like that, and people absolutely. Will, it's so no, I mean that's sad another that people thing. Cheer that, like and the, we don't have the Energy Star anymore, folks. Yeah, Energy Star. It's like it's like it's like Mao. But just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to end the line what you're saying, and then I'll go back to you guys. That the, in a lot of these cases, even the, and see that's the inverse. We we make fun of the troop thing, then it gets reported as he's gushing over the troops, and then other people laugh at the toilet and all of that. And there is a policy set there. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah. other thing is like that. I, I hate to say it, but this is also good propaganda, I think, because it's an issue that is in. in I mean, it's ridiculous. It's lunacy. I, I, I haven't been. I, my water pressure's fine. I don't think there's an epidemic of bad <laughs> water pressure water around the country. Okay. Um, just change your shower head, maybe. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of one in like Southern California where they're actually like is a water shortage crisis. right yeah it's it's not the you case know, where yeah. there's like more water than they know what to do with, right which, which yeah. would be a great problem and they got the rice fields they got everything it's all over the place but, but hollywood doesn't want you to have it they want the cocaine it's, but not you to have their water see how easy it is it's, it's easier to understand effective. than tax advantage savings accounts uh, right i mean that's another or 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 even more you know like, you know, Elizabeth Warren, we should have a Fed chair that recognizes that zero employment, uh, that zero unemployment isn't a problem. Yes, absolutely. Good policy initiative. That takes a bit more to understand. Uh, and but you know what you can't understand is all that steam coming out of the yeah. dishwasher. I told, I told Janet me. Yellen to fix the dishwasher. The ladies want the steam when they open it, <laughs> Janet. <laughs> The ladies want the steam because I'm a feminist. Uh, Sovereign, question for Matt. Have you checked out float plane for MR? I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? Uh, I think it's a water boat joke, maybe. Okay. Debate question. First, I want to say, uh, Connecticut comrade, Michael, Matt, Jamie, and Brendan, you all do great work. I listen to all of your podcasts frequently as well. Thank you. My question is how... Likely, do you think it is that the upcoming debate, Bernie's largely ignored, except maybe to ask him a question about his Jank endorsement? I think that is 99% likely. I do think with fewer people, on, they'll definitely try to do some bullshit with that, I'm certain. I think with fewer people on the stage uh, and the fact that, I, look, I'm not trying to be optimistic here. He will be ignored. He will be disrespected. I do think the fact that it is a Biden-Sanders race, if you're just looking at it by a polls right now, and that there's fewer people on the stage, it will be even more glaring, which probably just means that he'll get more hostile, unfair questions <laughs> instead of being totally ignored. Um, you know, look, I mean, and be ready. I mean, look, this guy starts winning primary. You don't, you don't, the, the, the ferocity of the war against him from the media, from the oligarchy, from the democratic establishment, for lack of a better word, 
is going to go a hell of a lot more than just being disgusting on the debate stage. They're trying to do this anti-Semitism thing at him. I mean, it's insane. It's demented. And it is fundamentally people guarding their class interests from the only candidate that actually threatens it. Sorry to say. Um, so it's it's going to be it's going to be a lot. Um, all right, let's take a call. You're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, hey, Michael. Hey. Oh, hey, this is Sean from Eastern Washington. Hey, Sean from Eastern Washington. What's on your mind? Uh, I called a couple weeks ago. We're just uh, nurses locally were getting ready to strike. Oh, oh um, yeah, yeah. They came to, they actually, they ended up agreeing, um, or they were coming to an agreement. Um, they were able to keep their PTO accrual. Like they're not taking a pay cut. They um, got some language in there to address like staffing and safety concerns. Awesome. Um, one thing they're not really talking about though, unfortunately is that it's kind of the grandfathered in thing. So current nurses get this, but new nurses aren't. Mm. And okay. It sucks. Well, that's not uh, I, I was talking with my mom about it. Cause she's one of these nurses and it's they're they're she's kind of they're kind of doing trying to do the same thing to them that they're doing to teachers across the nation. They want them to work more for less. Um, right. And I it's it's going to come to a head I think when boomers start to retire because a lot of them don't have savings and such, and they're going to turn to these healthcare professionals who are going to be I think dwindling. Um, right. And yeah, it's just going to be a problem. Definitely. So, I mean, is there some thinking about that in terms of the next phase or, or what? Uh, I'm not sure. The, the uh, WSNA.org, um, they just kind of announced that they came to the agreement. They're going to post the contract in that eventually. Um, I would hate to think that even these grandfathered in nurses wouldn't then eventually, you know, stand up for, for future nurses at some point in, down the road. Um, it's just, it's still concerning because uh, you never know. Right. But I, I have talked to some of them, and there is kind of some guilt there with with the deal that they came to. So I, I, I definitely think they they would still be allies. I think they would still be supportive of like Medicare for all or something. Right. Well, thanks for the update. Appreciate it. I oh, appreciate you guys. Uh, we'll see you at the, the debate tonight. All right, man. Take care. Yeah. Yeah, fortunately. The, speaking of a union. Yeah, speaking of a union that didn't have solidarity with its fellow workers, uh, you're calling from a 585 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Annie calling from Rochester. How are you? <clears throat> hey, Annie from Rochester. Good. How are you? What's on your mind? So uh, two things, like um, blah, 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 Tulsi, I'm really angry, and... <laughs> You know, I mean, I never trusted her, but um, I got a hot take on that. But I think the more pressing issue is what is up with Devin Nunez? Um, so this has been bugging me for about a week or so. Yeah. The guy's best, his best defense or why he wasn't talking to Lev Parnas is was he was talking with Lev Parnas's wife, maybe? Really? Is that true? I you, haven't but... heard that. That's awesome. He's like, I wasn't talking. I was cucking him. I wasn't conspiring. <laughs> if that's true, that's so awesome. He, uh, yeah, he. I mean, like, he didn't say it outright, but like his the the behind the scenes answer was the phone number that he was talking to. She could have picked up and not left. Yeah, Arna. exactly. And maybe, maybe I met her so on. <laughs> what was that old website that Christian was shut down? Christian Mingle. Yeah, no, I was thinking of another one. What was the one that they shut down? Like the uh, cheating oh, website? Oh, uh, yeah, the, I think it's like, uh, oh, God, it's called like, it. somebody's name. I forget um, it. I, I missed, I flubbed it. Uh, it doesn't matter. Madison, Ashley yeah. Madison. Yeah, I found her at Ashley Madison. Yeah. Stop trying to smear me. <laughs> That would be a fun Jimmy so Dore like, segment. So he's, a, he's, on, he's on Ashley fucking Madison. <laughs> and so the Democrats are trying to say it's that because they're supporting the deep state. <laughs> well, they're king shaming him out right. of being a oh, cheater yeah. or something. Well, I've been to that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're Devin Nunez's wife, you got to be wondering, like, what's his lady look like? And I, I looked her up. She's really hot. I'd be worried. Like, <laughs> I'm talking to... 
I'm being really worried. Like, that... you think his cow is worried about his actions? His wife has got to be really worried oh, about his yeah. actions. Oh, yeah. Ooh, like kind of... actions. Yeah. A lot of actions. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Lev. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> But on the other hand, so, it's not like I Devin mean, Nunez is much of an upgrade. I mean, I mean, maybe she's just into that. Yeah, I mean, maybe she. I don't know. But loaded but middle Lev aged is cooler. Men. Lev's cooler. He's got some Ukrainian like shadow energy to him. He's not just some like farm yeah, indigenous meat indigenous like just some like indignant meathead farmhand. He's all just like president did nothing wrong. Oh, hello, Mrs. Barnes. Ah, uh, probably shouldn't be leaving a call trail between us, but ah, uh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah, so like I don't know, it just it seems super fishy that you're gonna be on like an eight minute phone call with this like gangster's hot wife and then you got your wife at home wondering what you're up to. That's all I'm saying. But, I mean that's your best defense is it's okay, I was talking to the hot wife. <laughs> drama. That's an awesome that's call. Drama. Annie, all thank right. you. You killed it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. All right. Oh, we got Bye. it. We got the video that she's talking about. Okay, let's play this. That's hilarious. In order to try to get this Parnas guy, who I've never met, <laughs> were you to, ever to on the phone him. with him though? Because there's well, yeah, I said that. Phone call. So what I said yet? I said this yesterday. I went through my records on Friday. Okay, and I and very clearly, I got a call from from a, a number that was Parnas's wife. I remember talking to someone, and I did what I always do, which is that if I even don't know who they are, you. You put them to staff, and you okay. let and you let staff, staff work with that person. Yeah. But we also checked. I will even say this: we've checked all of our records. We have no information from Parnas. We have no documents. We have no. We, we have nothing. We have no emails. So so there's there's nothing that we have in our in our control from Parnas. But you know who's working with Parnas? If Parnas is such a bad guy, Adam Schiff is the guy working with Parnas. Adam Schiff and the Democrats are the ones that are talking to Parnas and Parnas's wait, wait, lawyers. Wait, wait. <laughs> I do. I, I don't want to get wrapped up in this stuff, but I, I love this. Okay. The dude is cooperating with the Democrats as part of a legal formal process <laughs> because they're impeaching the fucking president. Yeah, working with and them. And he is connected with them. And he is drawing a parallel. That's like, that's like literally saying like, why were you on a burner phone talking to the head of this drug cartel? Well, I don't know why. Might have been talking to his wife. But what you really got to ask is why are the detectives in the case he's testifying in working with him? That's what you need to focus on. <laughs> balls. That is balls. Yo, if he's doing that and smashing the guy's wife, I think we need to give Devin Dunia some respect. <laughs> you you got you to ask why they're talking to him. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. New Jersey uh, just passed licenses for all legislation. There are numerous, endless, practical and humanitarian reasons why this is an obvious and good call that we've enumerated many times on the show. And so we wanted to play this really positive and happy footage of people in New Jersey celebrating this well-earned victory. Awesome. So it'll go into effect. It'll make uh, your roads safer in the state of New Jersey. It will uh, make people uh, have access to certain vital uh, services that they may need, help them set up bank accounts. Um, here is uh, an activist explaining the implications of this briefly to Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! 
It took us almost 20 years to get to the moment that we are in now. Uh, prior to 2001, New York State residents were able to obtain a driver's license, and then all of that quickly changed. Um, a lot of um, New York State residents need um, a way to move um, from point A to point B to take their kids to school. Um, it's something that it shouldn't be a privilege to anyone. It's something that um, people need to better improve their livelihoods, and it's super exciting um, to now have New York State residents be able to apply um, for a driver's license. Mm. It took us. So is this, wait, so this happened in New Jersey or Both New York? Both places. Both places. Okay, that's that's synchronized. All right, that's fantastic. That's really good news. Um, Australian Angela, hi, my country co controls a large percentage of the global coal exports, a larger percentage of the global coal exports than Saudi does of oil exports. So next time you hear people talk about emissions and they start saying, what about the country? What about their government? Please feel free to bring up Australia's reckless behavior. We need to be called out. Sydney's air is worse than India's air from bush smoke uh, fire, from bush fire smoke. Governments won't even give funding for volunteer firefighters or have appropriate face masks. And the cherry on top is that they just gave approval for a Norwegian energy company, Ek Equinor, to drill for oil in the Great Australian Bight. Merry fucking Christmas, hashtag Ozpol. Uh, Australia is a big problem and a progenitor like Israel is in some ways of, of this global far right uh, governance. Colo mm, there's yeah. settler colonial nations. <laughs> this is also true. I'm talking the modern iteration, but yes. But I it's mean, just like, it's, it, I don't, I, I think it's like, I guess it's just not a coincidence to me. Like, escaping history is a project. Uh, Lev Parnas's hot wife, best call of the year. <laughs> That's right. You know what? We are right under the wire for best ofs. And uh, Annie from upstate. Is it Anna or Annie? I apologize. I think Annie. Nailing it. Colin from Nebraska. Being able to turn your phone screen off is why I pay $150 a year for YouTube's premium. Maybe when I get Bluetooth headphones, I will end my subscription. Can't charge my phone and listen with traditional headphones. Pixel 2 is what I have. Okay. That's why I got it, actually. And so, because I play stuff from YouTube for this show all the time and I don't want to be bothering with advertisements. Indeed. Um, we don't talk about this enough, but there is an ongoing genocide uh, genocidal project. This is clip number six I'm setting up in Burma or Myanmar. I still have trouble. Uh, I, I mean, it, it is Burma. I mean, it is Myanmar rather, but Burma was the name that people uh, called it who supported the democracy movement there. And the leader of that movement, it cut across society. It was uh, leftists and liberal activists. It was a significant portion of the organized Buddhist community. Uh, was Aung San Suu Kyi, who was really, you know, that was somebody that when I was becoming aware of politics was a hero. Um, incredible, I mean, objective physical courage, facing down a military dictatorship, in-house arrest, um, one of the most brutal regimes on earth. Uh, and she maintained a political commitment for decades. Now, when she first came out of power and she started negotiating, because there was a liberalization that really started kind of happening in 2012, but the military was still, you know, in many respects, key respects in control. And, and they still are, uh, even as the, there has been a sort of partial democratization. And people started seriously criticizing Aung San Suu Kyi uh, because it became very apparent very early on that she would not be a voice for minority rights and certainly not the Muslim Rohingya. And in the very beginning, frankly, I actually kind of had a little bit of, and it might have been, I think it was a pragmatic streak I have, which is good. And I think it was also my own attachment to my admiration for her of saying, what happens when somebody who is a saint, frankly, that's her role in global politics and a Nobel Prize winner and all the rest of it becomes an actual politician in a difficult situation. She's going to make her plays and calibrate and try to game things out. What has emerged in the last several years is that she does have a democracy view in a Buddhist nationalist container and a growth of a fascistic Buddhism, which is there, just as, of course, there's fascistic versions of every single religion. And, and I would say the, the, the violence and extremism of Buddhism is actually a very good lesson because I, I would actually be willing to stipulate 
uh, with with uh, you know the militant atheists who are so fixated on Islam that Buddhism textually gives you less room to work with than the Bible or the Torah or the Quran for promoting uh, pogroms or violence. Less room to work with than, frankly, certain Hindu scriptures. I mean, I I don't understand how you look at classic Buddhist texts and you can build a foundation of ethno-state violence. I mean, I, you can pretty clearly understand that in other religious texts. Now, obviously, they can be read in entirely different ways, and we need to get away from a one-dimensional silly atheism and recognize the complexity of religion in the world. However, uh, and, and part of the lesson there is that even something as herbivorous, if we want to use Christopher Hitchens' phrase, as Buddhism, can be turned into a mass, as part of a mass killing machine. And this is also a dynamic in Sri Lanka. You saw this reflected in recent elections. And Aung San Suu Kyi has not only not protected or spoken out on behalf of the Rohingya during a genocide, she has consistently minimized what's happening there. She has one time uh, was angry with a BBC interviewer and I believe directly asked her, are you a Muslim? Uh, she has appeared with Orban in Hungary uh, and her allegiances and her politics have become quite clear and it's a tragedy. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, for the victims. This is uh, uh, Reed uh, Brody. He's a counsel for Human Rights Watch, which is another conversation. But this is a very, this is a worthwhile clip. Here he is talking about Aung San Suu Kyi on Democracy Now! You know, this was a spectacular moment for international justice with, you know, the eyes of the world live, the case live streamed uh, to Myanmar, to the Rohingyas around the world. You had Gambia laying out the case uh, that the government of Myanmar was committing genocide. And Aung San Suu Kyi, the de facto leader, uh, was there listening and participating. Um, Obviously, you know, she went there for domestic political reasons uh, to show that, you know, she was in solidarity with the military uh, who continue to rule uh, in many ways the country, uh, in solidarity with those majorities in, in the country who hate and despise um, the Rohingyas and have mistreated them uh, not just for the last couple of years, but for many years. Um, but, you know, it, it's a spectacular fall from grace uh, for a woman who was the no, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, an icon of the human rights movement, uh, now to be sitting there, standing there, forcefully defending uh, her government, a government which, as you said, uh, has displaced uh, over a million Rohingyas that has committed systematic uh, rape uh, and the destruction of villages. Um, and to have this transmitted all over the world, um, again, I don't think, you know, from an international point of view, this was a disaster for her. I mean, if somebody is accusing you of a crime, of genocide, no less, uh, you usually you want to run away from those charges, hide them. By going to The Hague for domestic reasons, she guaranteed that the world would be watching, that the cameras of the world um, would be focused on these very accusations. That's exactly right. And uh, we need to connect that with what's happening in Sri Lanka, with the Indian government's uh, clear initial phases of a cleansing project of its Muslim population as part of their own fascistic political tradition. And in an entirely different context, we have to connect that with how some of the same mechanisms are playing a role uh, in, in uh, what China is doing to the Uyghur community. Um, so we, we'll talk about that more. Let's go to clip number nine. The Democratic Republic of Congo has been plagued by multiple civil wars. The roots of this go back to a Belgian and CIA orchestration of an assassination of the great independence leader Patrice Lumumba, and then a dictatorship, uh, Mobutu Sese Seko, ran the country from the mid-60s to 1997, which he ran as a U.S. client state kleptocracy that fed on theft, mass human rights abuses, and stoking ethnic divisions. Now, part of the reason, though, that there's still so much conflict is that vital minerals in Congo 
uh, fuel our iPhones. Our uh, lithium, I believe, is also there. This is this is a place that in people's imagination and in people's essentialism and frankly bigotry towards Africa, it gets slotted off as either something to ignore or like, oh man, you know, it's just one of those places where people are always fighting wars. And there is a very clear history and very clear, in this case, US and, Bel and uh, Belgian hand in the context for this, historically. And in the present tense, you have, uh, the fuel of those conflicts, uh, as well as broader labor rights abuses coming from companies like Apple that are in the center of the global supply chain. So places that people get slotted in a periphery are in the center. And this is a very cool report, again, from Telesaur, of Connolly's families looking for to attempt a process of suing Apple and Tesla. God forbid, I know. Elon Musk is going to save humanity. Why do they hate progress and yeah. technology? It seems that some people uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo hate science and innovation. Oh, no, wait. They don't want kids to be injured in mines, mining resources for these wealthy companies. Let's watch some of this report. Basically, it's talking about multiple kid, uh, people killed in mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Cobalt is a main component of batteries used in phones, electric cars, and other devices. And children are still mining this material. The lawsuit says that this mining falls within the supply chain of tech companies. Therefore, making op Apple and other big players partially responsible for the deaths and suffering of children working in Congolese mines. Jeez, look how small those... Oh, Jesus. Families are looking for compensation for unjust enrichment, as well as negligent supervision and emotional distress. 60% of cobalt in the world comes from Congo. Tech companies are making a killing while this remain while this country remains one of the poorest worldwide that's it that's the story that's the world system we got to change folks it's amazing to hear you hear like um uh, articles about british mining in like the 1930s or something like that it's just the same thing same just, thing it, like back breaking work having to crouch being tiny i mean frankly like one of the reasons you see children thrown down mines so often is because they're small enough to walk down them yeah that's absolutely screaming into the void. If anyone still isn't convinced that billionaires are problematic, please consider what George Lucas has done to the star Wars franchise. Bronze plan. Why don't Democrats clearly highlighting the fact that Trump is directing the withholding of aid without notifying Congress is, is illegal regardless of reason. All their details of wrongdoing seem harder to prove to the public and just seem like icing on the cake. To be fair, I think the Democrats make this point. Yeah, I think they When they, they say, have like, the facts point. haven't been disputed, which they haven't. Yeah. Uh, Goth Cola. Michael, do you know what's up with Jordan Peterson's weird Soviet obsession, like naming his daughter after Gorbachev and hoarding Soviet-era artwork in his house? Asking because I knew you read his books, part of research for your forthcoming book, Against the Web, Slick uh, slick Plug. Yes, decent, very good plug. I don't, but I, I could tell, I think the artwork, because he's got this generic obsession with the Soviet Union as the only place where there was ever totalitarianism. Yeah. I didn't know about his daughter. That's, that's. Let's say he's, a, um, there's other ways to put this, but uh, one way is to say an enthusiastic anti-communist. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, seen a lot of Hindu phobes criticizing Tulsi, not wanting to piss off her RSS supporters that love Trump. <laughs> okay. I see you're being sarcastic. Um, That's a, I mean, it's hard to tell sometimes with that stuff. I guess we could talk about this for a minute. I'm, I'm honestly not terribly invested in the Tulsi conversation at this point, but, uh, we could play. A minute of it. I think, do we have sound of her talking about this? Uh, oh, you know what, dude, it's a million. I, look, I don't care. I, I, I honestly, I don't care. I don't care. I just, what else? Like, 
I think that there's three things about Tulsi Gabbard. She is on the receiving end of attacks from absolutely disgusting people like Hillary Clinton. Definitely. And it is weird that she is, you know, she's held to a different standard from other people that are uh, uh, horrible. Uh, her foreign policy uh, is not good. It is not some herbivorous peace plan that people seem to think it is. She's a self-described hawk on the war on terror. And if she's updated those views, that's not clear to me. Um, she does have uh, connections to the Hindu far right. She has not. She has used the same type of language that foreign propagandists for Modi government used to justify what they're doing in Kashmir. She met with General Sisi. Meeting with Bashar al-Assad is absolutely not a problem. It absolutely is something that a pragmatist uh, absolutely would need to do. Uh, echoing some of his talking points and the totalized nature of the opposition to him in Syria, which is my perception of some of what she did, is a problem. And number three, I think this is already incredibly well, like... I think people that are able to listen and absorb a critique already understand this. And that, by the way, includes a wide range of people. It includes people that really hate her and it includes people that still have some sympathy for her. But anybody that's able to have any type of semi-coherent conversation about her, I think have absorbed the obvious and smart critiques of her. Then there's other people that I think, you know, uh, I hate her, uh, frankly, I think beyond like, I, I don't see why she's more hateable than Pete Buttigieg, is how I'll put it. And Hillary Clinton has infinitely more bodies uh, than Tulsi Gabbard in terms of reality. But then on the other hand, there's, you know, there is a there is an obsessive, uh, like, cult faction around her that will not listen to any number of just endless problems. So I, uh, it, it's boring. I mean, honestly, yeah. it's like a two... Look, if she hurts Bernie in New Hampshire... I think it's fucking disgusting. And I also really am confused by this notion. Like, it seems to me that people who support Tulsi, this is the last thing I'll say. It, like, people understood. <laughs> this is actually a com this is one of the only commonalities between Warren and Tulsi people that just annoy me. You're in a primary. You're running against each other. It might mean that by the time we get to the convention, I certainly hope that if Elizabeth Warren or Tulsi Gabbard have any capacity to influence that outcome, they will support Bernie Sanders. He is in a position to get the nomination. And then if that happens, I will praise both of them extravagantly. Right. As of now, there is not a secret pact between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. They're running against each other. And I wish Elizabeth Warren didn't run. And Tulsi Gabbard, the Warren people say there's a secret pact and the Gabbard people just say that it's helping Bernie. When literally, I think those couple of percentage points, at least anecdotally and from a lot of people that I hear, I, I, they, those are Bernie percentage points. And look, I'm vote however you want to vote, but you ain't helping I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't, I don't, I really don't get this like across the board. This, this is, you know what? This is Sam for this one. This is a zero. This is literally a zero sum yeah. game. So I, I, all of this other like Michigas and nonsense that look, if you support, you know, if somehow you think there's like some type of group visualization process that can make Tulsi president, then you should oppose Bernie running. And if you don't want Warren, then you should oppose, you know, then you should oppose Bernie. Well, whatever. If you want Biden, you should oppose all. Like, it, well, I don't know. This isn't like some, you know, middle school, like Marvel comic, like Avengers team. They're running against each other for something. And we're talking about Col Tulsi in this case. She hurts his prospects in key primary states. Why? Why, if she is helping Bernie, is she literally relocating her entire campaign to bank on New Hampshire, which maybe she gets four or five percent out of. Where do you think that's coming from? Even if I stipulate that some of it is Republican crossover voters or people who wouldn't vote Democrat anyways. OK, sure. But what's that doing? I mean, I what I, I just I mean, she also has a worse Medicare for all so, or health care plan than uh, Warren does. Of course, she has a worse. Yeah. Medic I mean, Warren has a. Rube Goldberg fantasy of getting to Medicare for all. And Tulsi just dropped Medicare exactly. for all. Exactly. 
I don't, I, whatever. I, I can't, I mean, honestly, it just, the stupidity of some of these conversations is just exhausting. Yeah, and I, and I don't really know what else can be added to it. Also, let's just do a drive by uh, Donald Glover, should, like his Yang stuff. You oh, address my that God. Now? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can, I feel super vindicated in saying Donald Glover is overrated. And another thing is the more you look into Yang's healthcare plan, I, I did see, I should have picked it. I saw a tweet by some guy who said uh, that basically like, I apologize, Bernie people were right to not trust the guy after he read his health care plan. So there are some people out there that are still, you know, thinking. I haven't seen as many apologies as I'd like from oh all the Yang I mean, people that. And there is no sure. worse group. I've decided definitively. I, because I, there are Tulsi people I've interacted with that can actually engage in points and have a few to make themselves. I, 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 all I get from Yang people is, you're stopping me from getting a thousand dollars a month, motherfucker. <laughs> and he believes in humanity. How dare you? Yeah, we were right, you nerds. Yeah. I think the only way, exactly. <laughs> the only way you're going to get like some sort of intelligible conversation with a Yang supporter is going to the heart of darkness of Silicon Valley and just go to those like Y2 incubator guys and just they'll be the ones who are like, oh, yeah, no, we're going to be living in pod, individualized pods and we're going to need some money for people who just have nothing to do anymore. Right. It literally, like, I'm trying to convince Peter Thiel to not liquidate all of you. <laughs> so we have this a, is a hedge. Yeah, we, yeah, we're trying to get you some ramen and some video game materials while you <laughs> live a totally depressing unfulfilled life in the automation zone uh peter thinks that uh we should experiment with different ways of killing people to see if it could alter our mirror neurons but uh we actually just would like to give you a ubi yeah and that he, would be by far as brendan points out that would be by far the most humane and intelligent argument for this agenda which is all hope is lost politics is done we are in a post-democratic, you know, like sort of children of men meets Blade Runner. And there's a handful of oligarchs that are like, oh, just throw these idiots some change. Yeah. The nice <laughs> ones say that. And then Peter Thiel's like, I think Snowpiercer could be a really good idea. Why would you give them money when you could drink their blood? <laughs> there's perfectly good uses for some of these people being killed so we can drink their blood. Uh, everybody who said Donald Glover is overrated, which includes me, big point on this one. That is what I mean. I mean, honestly, you can talk to certain Tulsi people who will say, what about the, you know, I liked what she said about uh, defense spending or she put out a good comment on Bolivia. Like, you know what I mean? Or, or, her, or she votes a certain way on environmental protection. Okay. Right. And I'll still argue it across the board on the merits, but like, okay. Okay, versus like, you're not, you're not listening to the Andrew Yang human progress chart where he says he actually wants everything to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you acknowledge his literally imaginary intentions, you're not being fair to him. He said he supports the spirit of medic. Actually, you know what? Here's my final thing for Andrew Yang people. I support the spirit of Andrew Yang. <laughs> yeah. But not him. Also, yeah. Well, yeah. But I support the spirit. And if you don't give me credit for that, you're sliming and smearing us. Also, uh, welcome to politics. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to this like interesting political process where people actually measure what you're actually proposing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I would even be so so far as to say that obviously Donald Trump has ill intentions for most people. Uh I, I think that there I think that there are several Democrats running as sucky and as nerdy as they are that I would be totally willing to stipulate have generalized vague positive intentions for their fellow humans. So I don't even think I can't even give Andrew Yang a distinguishing marker in that. OK, I'm going to put Andrew Yang and Cory Booker and, uh, and Julian Castro as having sort of general-ish positive intentions for their fellow humans, which uh, are definitely subject to change if the rubber meets the road. And by rubber meeting the road, in all three of their cases, I would say uh, Israel <laughs> and probably also hedge funds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Jesus Christ. Yang people. And I'm, I don't, I, by the way, it, 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 it doesn't matter. You can keep tweeting. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's over, folks. It's over. It's over. 
and and you, didn't have you only have yourselves and your candidate to blame. Yeah, it's all your fault. You, yeah. you blew your chance at a thousand dollars a month, yeah, guys, by not taking the concerns of us seriously. You so. blew it. If you came to us and you said, "Look, of course I don't want some, you know, Silicon Valley like whatever gimmick candidate," but can Bernie add this a G a month on top of all these other important reforms? You might have gotten a guy like me to say yes. But you blow it. What's that movie from? I think that's from. I think that's from like. Uh, I think that's it's De Niro, a right? sketch. I thought it was De Niro. Uh -uh. Some like, like Meet the Fockers or something. Like you blew it. For the record, I think Atlanta is still an excellent, excellent TV show, and I I will give Donald Cro Glover all his the credit shows he deserves for that in his spirit and in actuality. It, although, does Atlanta not become worse when you read it as like this? We were talking about this. It is a brilliant, searing critique of all the issues Bernie Sanders is talking about. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I agree It's kind of that. depressing. I didn't think Donald Glover uh, was uh, earn in uh, real life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, uh, yeah, I support. Yeah, but this is my new thing. Is I, well, I actually support the spirit of Andrew Yang. <laughs> I do answer to everything. <laughs> and then what's the one with Tulsi? Uh, if you criticize me for criticizing her, you're being uh, that anti-Semitic. Let's just throw it out. <laughs> Super anti-Semitic. <laughs> That's fun. I got the appeal of these people now. Uh, you're calling from an 818 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Pete Perlman. I'm calling from Sherman Oaks, California, Los Angeles. Hey, Pete. How you doing? What's on your mind? Good. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm a little more optimistic, or at least not as pessimistic as I was before the main vote yesterday, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm sort of seeing more options. It's not cut and dried that it's just a done deal that it goes to the Senate and dies. I think there are more options as I see it now. What's um, an option? I don't know that more of open. What? What do you mean by that? Like what's an option? What? You said you see more well, options. Like, uh, yeah. Like, I don't know if it's that I'm a little more informed about that or if actual things have changed, but, um, like Pelosi has the option of, you know, delaying it more, and I thought it was just an automatic thing. It gets but shot what, over what to the What good Senate would her and, delaying it do? And dies. What good would her delaying it do? Huh? What good would it would her delaying? Oh, I don't know. Do? For, for, I don't know. Is there any additional leverage? To, well, here's here's the thing too, uh -huh. um, and, and this is basically a question. Okay, with McConnell, yeah. he's been blatantly, brazenly saying how he's not impartial, and uh, and yet he's got a, as as the in effect foreman of the jury, he's in bed with the defense, and he's got to take an oath to be impartial. How does he reconcile that? Well, how do you see him because, handling that? Uh, I see him handling it like he does everything else. Fuck you. What are you going to do about it? That's it. So he's going to blatantly just yes. stand there and yes. say, I promise to yeah. be impartial with his hand up on yes. the fire. He will do wow, literally, yes, thousand percent. I know. That's what he's there for. That's his job, Pete. But I appreciate the call. But in that Thank case, yeah. wait a minute, one, okay. one more thing. In that case, won't there be a little more public pushback than there has been for him when it's so blatant and not out where, front not for where everyone his, to see? Definitely not in his party, obviously. They'll love it, but uh, maybe, maybe there'll be a few people, uh, you know, paying attention who won't like it. Although I will say, I mean, I think to the extent Mitch McConnell is known, he's already an incredibly unpopular figure. I mean, that's not where his power derives from. But I, I look, I think there are some people that might be tuning in through this process who will see just how naked it is with the Republicans. And that could serve mm -hmm. a good purpose. I appreciate your call, Pete. Thank you. Um, but, I mean, 
How does he wreck? That's the moonshot. I get what right? you're. Yeah, that's the moonshot. I, I I get where you're going, but anything that involves Mitch McConnell going, I don't know if I could do that. Just take it out of your mind. Take it out of your mind. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. I mean, actually, you know what's funny? In the way Mitch McConnell is closer to kill a person on Fifth Avenue than Trump. Like Trump is off talking shit, and McConnell's like, oh, actually, we're actually sent protocol. We're actually shot man for Avenue. Tell him to go by the docks. Yeah, it's all by the docks. Bodies full. Listen for there. the fog. Horn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or fentanyl can be a tough business. So I heard. <laughs> uh, all right, let's do clip number ten. Bernie Sanders is surging. Uh, I actually n caught the other day that Nate Silver, who has had this like bizarre, embarrassing, pathological vendetta against Bernie Sanders and against progressive politics more broadly, uh, was actually on ABC News, I believe, saying, yes, Bernie Sanders is absolutely positioned to win, which it goes against everything he's been saying constantly for months. I, I think I've always thought on some levels this is a Biden-Sanders race. And... You know, and also this goes contrary to what a lot of people in this space think, which is that I don't think Biden is out. I don't. I think Biden is so much more resilient than people realize. And I I think the fact that he's, yes, he has slipped in Iowa and New Hampshire, though those would be the places he would slip. I think the fact that Joe Biden, who there is, Look, I think there's certain things that he does that we don't like, certain ways he yells at protesters, some of which are, I think, objectively make him look bad and are disgusting, others of which I think are gross, but I see how they play well, frankly. But I think that watching him in debates, regardless of content, and seeing the fact that he clearly is, is he's missing some steps, is as polite as I could put it. He still leads. And he still is a generally popular figure. I think people need to get much more serious about how formidable he is. And conversely, Bernie Sanders has a movement. He has grassroots energy in a way that is completely unparalleled in modern politics and a systemic agenda to fit with it. I think those are the poles of where the policy questions are right now, as well as temperamentally. Sanders and the squad, Biden and the status quo. And then other people are playing different variations on different themes. But those are the choices, and those are the two lead candidates. I think it's interesting how that lines up. Here's Bernie Sanders talking about campaign contributions. My opponents will tell you that campaign contributions from the wealthy and the powerful don't have an impact. Why do you think these CEOs are making contributions? When you make those contributions, you're first in line to get your concerns taken care of. I believe in democracy, not billionaires owning the system. Our campaign is funded by the working people of this country. We need to take on all of the corporate elite. We need a government that works for working families, not just big campaign contributors. I'm Bernie Sanders, and I approve this message. I'm thrilled at how much better these ads are getting. Uh, that was really disturbing to me for a long time. I thought some of the ads they were putting out were cookie cutter, boring. And, uh, you know, for all of the other things, the grassroots organizing, the role you can play with phone banking and so on, the role of social media, all of this stuff is profoundly important. But we still are a television country. Um, and even on social media, I mean, those 30 second clips to be that effective and clear is incredibly important. So that's a really encouraging sign from the campaign. Uh, we should just point to this yeah. uh, NBC News article here. Uh, it has yeah. an interesting thing at the way bottom. Uh, Single-payer Medicare for all still popular with Democrats. As the Democratic candidates continue to draw battle lines over health care policy, the survey finds that a single-payer government health care plan that would eliminate... Eliminate private insurance garners the support of nearly 7 in 10 Democratic primary voters, 68%. In September, 63% said the same. So that's a five-point bump. Also, uh, and uh, Brendan Sutton pointed this out, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully he'll be a Friday guest more. Uh, brilliant. Please follow Pretty Bad Lefty on Twitter. He said, like, anytime somebody just tells you that support for single payer has dropped in the polls, like it's a, like some vacuum... Be really clear about two things. First thing, I'll get right out of the way. People won't like it. Elizabeth Warren, the way she's handled it, is absolutely hurting the cause of single payer on a political level. Sorry, undeniable. I, I 
I'm sure plenty of people would deny it. Probably I mean, people Sam would... said as much as well. So, absolutely. I mean, Taking again, the effectiveness of costs over tax raising taxes out of the equation. Hundred percent. She introduced a regressive measure uh, to keep. I mean. It, so again, I'm not going to belabor it. I know the criticism tr uh, triggers certain people, and I'm I'm willing to take that triggering. But just to be really clear, if Bernie Sanders somehow got into a position where he did like this Rube Goldberg thing where he costed it out, it's going to be in two parts. I mean, first of all, obviously he wouldn't do that because it's a core issue for him. But I mean, I, look, I, I'm I'm not I can't think of an equivalent issue at the moment, but I'm just saying on an objective political level, she has harmed that effort. And then the other thing that has happened is that there is a systemic and relentless propaganda effort. Democratic staffers from Clinton and the Obama administrations are hired by insurance companies to lie, to spread propaganda and misinformation. Pete Buttigieg uh, and Joe Biden are out here fear mongering about this every single day. Every single question that the moderators and debates have had about this have been framed in a negative way. So if there's a couple drops in the polls, it's because a major candidate has put out a plan for it, which is extremely ineffective and is correlated with her own decline in the polls. And, and this is never going to change, there is a massive propaganda effort against this already that will only intensify. So be real. That's why Nira Tandon coming on Twitter and saying, actually, the wall is more popular than single payer. Well, guess what? The wall has the entire support of the right. And people like in high positions like Nira Tandon are kneecapping single payer every chance they get. There you go. I mean, frankly, and, and you know, it's so funny because it's such a, it, that's actually such a perfect symmetry with the fantasy life that so many establishment elite Democrats have about never Trump Republicans who have no constituency, no power, don't represent anything in reality. If there was actually Actually, a never Trump constituency in the Republican Party, then you would see people with actual power trying to kneecap racist initiatives, which you will never see because it has nothing to do with the Republican Party. But there's plenty of people, most people with institutional power in the Democratic Party that are willing to be propagandists, paid or otherwise, free of charge for the insurance industry and the HMOs. I mean, Jim Messina. Jim Messina. Well, Jim Messina, I'm a Assuming has plenty of clients like that. Jim is seen as a scumbag. Uh, okay, this is fun. Clip number 11. Uh, Eric Blanc, uh, I believe, brings us to our attention. Eric Blanc, great uh, education reporter for Jacobin. Really brilliant guy. And this is fun. Strikes and protests like we talked about last week in France are ongoing. And the French and their sort of perfect symmetry. If you, you ever spend any time in France, you notice like that, 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 there's like it's stunningly it, it, like there's a lot of beauty and then also there's a lot of pungent odors so the sort of french juxtaposition of a, a strong commitment to aesthetics that make certainly americans look like total philistines and at the same time a lot of comfort with sweat and odor and so on and a real uh and and, I, and a fondness of 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 poop humor which i find baffling but i mean this is a group of people thought Jerry Lewis was super funny. So they did <laughs> shots fired. So this is uh, RIP though. This is a uh, French labor union uh, dumping two tons of manure in front of a public event held by president Macron's party. Uh, match. <laughs> this is the most extra. It's so French. <laughs> oh, there's two of them. There's two. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Clap for the poop. <laughs> you blew it. Is it De Niro line in Copland? Really? I feel like Copland's a little bit more of a serious movie but whatever what do i know all right we're gonna take one or two more calls and then we're gonna be on our way you're calling from a 505 area code who are you where are you calling from hello this is angie from new mexico angie from new mexico how are you what's on your mind 
I'm good. Um, I want to say one quick thing about the Tulsi Gabbard thing. Um, okay. And then, and then I'm moving on. Just one. Um, it just bugged me that she resigned from the DNC because, in protest, because they were cheating Bernie. But then, when our president is trying to cheat, all of a sudden she's neutral. Mm. So that bothered me that she has kind of two different stances on the same thing. But beyond that, I mean, frankly, um, she even said, and I don't, I keep not wanting to get into this, but even her statement, which we won't play, she said he did wrongdoing, but it doesn't, but it's like, it, you know, it's bad, but I only want to censure him. Like, I just, I don't even understand that, frankly. Like, I, it's just like, it was political. He did it or he didn't. Well, of course, it's totally political, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Who cares? Okay. It's and, a different right. type of so censure script. Other- right. Right. Um, the the thing I was calling about was I watched the entire um, Trump thing uh, rally last night, right. and I noticed that he's kind of easing into a lot of the policies that Bernie is running on. I bet he talked about health care. He talked about electric cars. He talked about things, and it's almost like he's grooming them as he gets closer. So that was one thing I wanted to point out, Absolutely. and then kind of tying into that. And I know you were going to talk about this was the all the vacancies at the Pentagon uh-huh, and uh-huh. how much he's been, um, you know, kind of talking about the military. And that's terrifying to me. That's like coup territory. And so I wanted you to speak on that a little bit, too, if you don't mind. I think he should be scared by what he's doing. I will say there's a really encouraging new graph, which I should have gotten, that I believe amongst members of the military, the, lead, the they are yeah. Bernie crushes for Kim. Angie, you're just a little static, so I'm going to let you go, okay? But I'll, I'll respond to it. Thanks so much for the call. Okay, thanks. Bernie leads in campaign contributions by a significant margin. Uh, this is... Uh, and it's and actually, for what it's worth, I mean, look, in this context, I'll take Buttigieg over Trump, too, obviously. And Buttigieg makes sense. Buttigieg actually is a veteran. Um, but this is a massive lead here for Bernie. This is, da- uh, this is data from 2019, and it's... Yeah. Quarter but, one to quarter three. Quarter one to quarter three. And basically, you have Bernie at the top. 181,000. 181,052. Uh, then Buttigieg, 79, 142. Then Donald Trump, 62, 821. Then Elizabeth Warren, 43. Uh, Tulsi's way down 30, there for yeah. a troop. Yeah, that's actually pretty surprising. I would actually that's expect, supposed to be her core brand proposition. I would expect Tulsi to be higher than that. She's um, probably bigger with guys who uh, thought about joining the military. <laughs> play a lot point. of Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The guy in the uh, the second male lead in the Tanya Harding movie. Yeah, Richard Jewell. <laughs> I just modded Battlefield 1 so I can play with Tulsa. <laughs> I support the spirit of it. Um, the Tulsi, Tulsi Twitch caucus. That's a good one. <laughs> Um, no, this is, I yeah. mean, the, yeah. I was, was reading a piece of forward policy about, um, Trump's, all these like, uh, Pentagon officials exiting, uh, Trump's administration posts. And basically they're having a really hard time finding civilian, uh, like policy experts to work at the Pentagon in like, you know, or like department of defense, um, in the Trump administration. And like, it's basically being left to just career military officials uh who have served so i don't know it seems no it's 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 incredibly dangerous and i mean obviously look the other thing you got to do is he's he's pardoning war criminals and i'm and we're talking like war criminals not in the sense that we would you know look you ask me i think that everybody in the chain of barack obama is definitionally a war criminal george w bush is absolutely a war criminal right uh you know and and certainly um you know, uh, Matt, look at Mattis and Fallujah for Christ's sake. I would, I would want to investigate that very thoroughly. But we're talking, but we're talking on a level of, okay, you went in, you murdered a bunch of people in cold blood in a village, and we as a military are saying that you committed murder, and, or at the very least manslaughter, we're putting you with charges. Trump is pardoning them, and then they are going and getting praised and lauded on Fox News. I mean, so yes, I mean... And then it's not even to mention the component we talked about on Tuesday, that of course there is a neo-Nazi element of Homeland Security and ICE and so on, or white supremacist or whatever. I mean, really disgusting, really grotesque, really extremely harmful people. 
And I have no doubt, you know, Bill Barr will be complicit every step of the way. I I think that people need to be incredibly aggressive and aggressive and very vigilant in the and this is another reason to get much broader than this impeachment process, frankly, uh, on those issues. I I could be being naive. I don't think we are at the point where if Trump look, I have no doubt. I I would be shocked if Trump loses and he doesn't try to stay in power. And I think Barr will support him. I think there will be support in the Republican Party. I think there might be vigilante violence connected to it. I don't know if the institutions are weak enough to sustain that. I could be being Pollyannish, but I I tend to think no. Uh, but these are things that are real. you got to be vigilant about. Uh, you're calling from a 214 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, is this me? Yes, this is you. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, please? nice. Ladies calling in today. Uh, this is Melissa from Dallas. Hey, Melissa. What's on your mind? Okay, I have two quick things, but the first one I want to talk about is laughing at Never Trumpers. Right. So, so I'm from Dallas. Lots of Republicans here. I was raised brainwashed in a Republican household. Literally thought CNN stood for Clinton News Network. Not a lie. Um, <laughs> Are you serious? You literally thought so, CNN stood for Clinton News Network? That's awesome. Absolutely. So how did you um, get out? How did your politics change? Sorry. I'm sorry. I have to ask you. How did your politics change? Uh, slowly, over the course of like 10 to 15 years, I my first election, I voted for Bob Barr because I was told that Obama was evil wow. um, and that I knew that I wasn't like my parents because I didn't like hate gay people right. or things like that. Right. Um, so very slowly, I kind of went libertarian, even though I didn't know what that was, just because it wasn't evil liberal and it wasn't what my family was right but yeah now i'm like a socialist and completely like disowned but oh i'm sorry um, about that last part so it, jesus eh, it's fine so um what the funniest thing for me is that my nuclear and extended family all republicans um and every single one of them has completely backed trump which is bonkers to me because Half of my family is Jewish, but I mean, as a lot of us Jews know, there are people that are like, I will do literally whatever, like I will vote for anyone that even gives lip service to Israel. And then right. the other half are just, you know, your run of the mill um, racist people. Right. Right. So my brother, I only have one brother, uh, one sibling, and he literally, just to make this clear, he campaigned for Romney twice. He was all on that Rubio train, like obsessed with the guy. I think he's like obsessed with people with good hair, but he was like completely so into really those too. But sorry. Well, I mean, Romney in a certain sense. And, well, Romney, you know, I get no doubt, but Rubio maybe. Eh. But anyways, that's not the point. Hmm. All right, so he's obsessed. So anyways, and and what's happening now? Where's he at now? Well, he's a never Trumper. Oh, I so see. he I didn't see. vote for Trump. He grew a conscious a little bit too along the way. Um, and the funniest thing to me during these holidays is getting to see him legitimately being called a Democrat by my family because he doesn't support Trump, even though he is in no way, shape, or form a Democrat. Uh, it's just a big old funny F you um, for me to see these. The same people that have been, you know, spewing propaganda, calling everyone else communists, everyone else socialists, regardless of what their opinion is. And now it's getting smeared on them, too. And I part of me is like, oh, you know, we should take those never Trumpers and, and coddle them and maybe we could turn them. No, it's just funny to me to watch them get pooped on. So that's my first, my first point is okay. just getting to enjoy that. All right. Enjoy your brother's uh, and then my, suffering. My second, All right. Next sorry, point. My second one is super quick because yeah. uh, I know that this is kind of the end of the show. But yes. um, I just wanted to quickly say that I've been in like the meme war for a while now. At first, I was fighting for Marianne. Uh, obviously, that's not happening. Um, now I'm using my memes for Bernie. Nice. 
But I just want to say, like, I know y'all aren't super on the meme train, but um, I just wanted to say that Elizabeth Warren and Pete Butt Edge Edge have the worst, lamest memes on the planet, <laughs> and they suck. What? No and way. I never wanted to give someone a swirly as much as those nerds. So that's all I wanted to say. Melissa, um, that is a you. definitely A plus call to end the show. I echo all of your sentiments and uh, enjoy your brother's suffering and keep memeing for Bernie. I will. Thank you for the <laughs> I will. All Thank right. you for the call. <laughs> she said I will. <laughs> uh I feel you know, if I think of her brother as a normal person having a bad time with his family about Trump, I feel bad for him. But if I personify her brother as like a miniature David Frum, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you just picture like just it's just some like unctuous like schmuck like David Frum. And he's just sort of like uh, he's portraying Reagan. And then they're all just like, you're a communist. <laughs> I think that actually as part of David Frum's war crimes accountability, that should be one of his uh, one of his areas. Um, I wanted to I'll get to the story, but I'll just say briefly, this is very significant that this judge in Brazil basically just said Lava Jato destroyed businesses and the public prosecutor's office didn't act transparently. That is another big upshot of what happened in Brazil is the complete destruction of Petrobras. Huge amount of revenue and jobs, as well as, of course, public service investment lost because of that. That's another legacy of this corrupt, politicized investigation. I mean, uh, it's one thing for fascism to take out a head of state. It's another to hurt the business. Well, it's a state-run business that was used for social uh, responsibility. So, all right, Trumpy Bear, do you think that when Sam goes into the bank, he yells, deposit? Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Nice. Yeah. All right. That's not going to be the last item of the day, but I still gave you one. <laughs> uh, okay, final call of the day. Austin and Houston. Lev Parnas's hot wife, best call of the year. All right, everybody, see you tonight at the debate. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess I'm where the choice was made, for the option where you don't get paid, for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101